Russia tonight breaking the nuclear arms control treaty with the United States. For the first time since the signing of the transformational New START treaty, Russia is refusing to allow the U.S. to inspect its nuclear weapons. Now, this move comes at a moment where the world faces the higher, highest risk of nuclear conflict since the Cold War, and it is happening as Putin and his military leaders have threatened nuclear war. With regard to the threat of a nuclear war, <clears throat> Svetlana Gennadievna, you are right. The threat is growing, so why hide the truth? We don't have the resources to defeat the NATO bloc with conventional means, but we have nuclear weapons for that. Uh, there's more where that came from. I mean, even two weeks ago, Putin's top ally and Russia's former uh, president, Dmitry Medvedev, warned, quote, the loss of a nuclear power in a conventional war can provoke the outbreak of a nuclear war. Putin's breaking the most significant arms treaty in modern history comes as his back is up against the wall. I want you to just listen to this uh, from Russian state media. This is a well-known and highly respected Russian analyst. By the start of the mobilization, our airborne forces lost 40 to 50 percent of the staff. 40 to 50 percent just coming out and saying that? Gone? Dead? And Western officials today warn that Putin does not have the manpower to replace all of them or the more than 100,000 Russians who are estimated to have already died on the battlefield. And Putin's reliance on the Wagner Group to fight is also now running, it appears, up against its own manpower issues. They're now apparently looking for prisoners from Ukrainian prisons. So these are Ukrainians who have been spending months in prison in a war zone, now being recruited to come out and kill Ukrainians for Wagner Group. The mayor of Melitopol today saying that Wagner fighters are being sent to Melitopol to, Melitopol to look for future Wagnerites among their prisoners. Now, the Wagner Group is trying to turn this weakness into a way to mock the United States, saying that it welcomes American fighters, too. The group has a press unit, and in a statement to CNN, they wrote this, we would like to inform you that if American citizens wish to join the Wagner Group, they can then send their appeal to the Wagner Press Service. We will definitely look into it. All right, in a moment, you're going to hear more from the front lines about the state of Putin's Wagner Group, which is so crucial to all of this, including why the Ukrainians say Wagner's fighters all often seem like they're on drugs. We begin tonight with Fred Plaikin on the ground in Ukraine near where some of the worst fighting has been raging in Bakhmut. And Fred, I know you've had a chance to be there on the front line. You've spoken to Ukrainian troops who are fighting the brutal Wagner soldiers. What are they telling you? Mm. Hi, Aaron. Well, they, they tell us that the going there is extremely tough and it's extremely difficult for them to hold the, the line precisely because of what you were just uh, saying, because the Wagner uh, group has such a high rate of attrition. They saw so many bodies at these frontline trenches that the Ukrainians are in. It's really difficult to defend these trenches. And just when the Ukrainians think they're done, the next wave of Wagner fighters come. Now, of course, the attrition rate among those Wagner fighters is extremely high. Many of them get killed. But as we know, for Yevgeny Prigozhin, the head of Wagner, all of these people are expendable. Now, we did manage to speak to some Ukrainian troops who fight Wagner virtually every day, who witness this every day, and here's what they told us. Going underground with Ukraine's frontline defenders against Russia's brutal private military company, the Wagner Group. Andrei and Borisic say they battle Wagner stormtroopers nearly every day. This is what it was like when a handful of their troops were attacked by about 200 Wagner fighters. We were fighting uh, for about 10 hours in a row, and it wasn't like just waves. It was uninterruptibly, so it was just like they didn't stop coming. Andre says his men took out scores of Wagner soldiers until they themselves had to retreat. 140 of them, 80 were wounded and 60 were killed. And uh, my platoon was uh, 13 people, plus several from infantry. It was about 20 soldiers from our side and, uh, no, let's say 200 from their side. Wagner's tactics, he says, they try to overwhelm the Ukrainians by sending waves of fighters, many of them convicts, recruited straight out of jail. Uh, they uh, make the group, let's say from 10 uh, soldiers, uh, is uh, passing 30 meters. Then they started digging in and keeping the position. 
Then next group is coming next 30 meters. They reach their position and, and uh, going uh, next 30 meters, also uh, digging in. Mm. And that's how uh, step by step they're trying to move forward. The Ukrainians say Wagner fighters often seem drugged. The machine gunner was almost getting crazy because he was shooting at them. And he said, I know I shot him, but he doesn't fall. And then after some time, when he maybe uh, bleeded out already, so he just only falls mm. down. Uh, it looks like it's very, very likely that they are getting some drugs before attack. The unit provided us with a recording they say is of Andrei questioning a captured Wagner fighter. We reached out to Wagner's boss, Yevgeny Prigozhin, about allegations of abuse in their ranks. This was his answer on Wagner's social media account. Dear CNN, he writes, do you really think that we will discuss our military issues with you while you are an open enemy? It's the same as discussing military matters and sharing information with the CIA. Andrei says no matter how many more fighters Prigozhin throws at them, they will resist. This is the war for freedom. It's a war for democracy, yes. It's not even for me, it's not even the war between Ukraine and Russia. But this is a war between a regime and uh, democracy. So some pretty strong words there, Aaron, and certainly one of the things that we did get uh, from those soldiers is that their morale is still pretty high, and they say that they themselves are pretty surprised at how well they are actually still be able to hold the line, despite the fact that the Russians are throwing so many bodies at all of this. And right now, for them, it's getting even more difficult because, of course, we know that Yevgeny Prigozhin, the Ukrainian, say, really wants to give Vladimir Putin a win there in Bakhmut. However, the Russian military also wants to give Vladimir Putin a win. That's why there's many Russian regular military units out there as well right now. So the Ukrainians really fighting two very, very strong forces in that area and trying to hold on, Aaron. Fred Plaikin, thank you so much. And incredible reporting there, hearing that soldier. I want to go now to Christo uh, Grozev, the executive director and lead Russia investigator for Bellingcat. His work was the core of the Oscar-nominated documentary Navalny where you can watch Christo track down Putin's men who poisoned the Russian opposition leader, Alexei Navalny. Christo also recently was put on Russia's most wanted list. Uh, so I want to start with Fred's reporting on the Wagner Group. There's a lot there. Uh, let's start with what we heard that soldier saying to Fred, talking about uh, Wagner prisoners and, prisoners and fighters, many of whom are prisoners, uh, right, uh, fighting in mass and appearing to be on drugs. Well, we have to be careful with uh, statements like this because it's kind of the oldest uh, trope in uh, warfare that people assume that the other side is on drugs. We've heard this back in the Second World War. We've heard it actually at the beginning of the war where the Russians were accusing the brave Ukrainians of being on drugs because otherwise they can't be so brave and advanced so, so quickly. Uh, so I don't know that that is a fact, but could it be a fact? I would say yes, because Prigozhin has an obsession with uh, chemical weapons, with poisons. He actually, his phone number is in the call records of the lead GRU military intelligence poison doctor of, uh, of, of the Russian army. They exchange information. There have been pre previous allegations that uh, Prigozhin has poisoned journalists as well. Um, and we know that this unit that he communicates with actually does develop advanced uh, medications, let's call it this way, for pain relief of soldiers. And any of these could have side effects or, or, or the main effect of actually putting a, a soldier in a sort of a drowsy state. Right. So when you say, you know, it, whether it's true or not, certainly there's enough data points that indicate it certainly could be it's, it's uh, and, and, and all of that. So when you hear uh, Fred also talking about these waves of fighters, the soldier talks about 200 uh, Wagnerites to about 20 Ukrainians. So we hear about those overwhelming numbers. At the same time, we're hearing that he's running out of soldiers too, uh, Wagner, and he's having trouble recruiting, trying to find, you know, maybe even Ukrainians and prisoners. How stable is Prigozhin's power right now? Well, what we're seeing is a competitive uh, market. We have the army competing against Prigozhin. Prigozhin could be competing against the army. Um, that's both a political uh, competition because Prigozhin wants to get a political role. We've discussed this on this show. Yes. And he's slowly progressing to actually being recognized as a political, almost a sovereign entity within Russia. Uh, one example of this is that only yesterday, the Russian Ministry of Defense 
finally promised that they will start providing heavy equipment to so-called volunteer units. And he's, he's mm -hmm. not the PMC, he's a volunteer unit. So right. they're recognizing him as one of, one of them. So he's achieving that. And therefore, um, I, I could say that the Ministry of Defense is losing in this political battle.